we're, we're very fortunate to have with us today uh, Loic Four, uh, uh, who is is currently a, a postdoc at Vanderbilt. Um, so Loic got his his start in science uh, in in Lyon, um, but then decided that he was more interested in in cytoskeleton and cell migration than in warm weather. So he moved to to Montreal. Uh, where he studied cell migration and, and cytoskeletal regulation, which which brought him then to do a PhD with Laura Macheski uh, in Glasgow. Uh, uh, and while he was in Laura's lab, he he discovered that this this really interesting protein FAM forty nine, uh, which which they've they've called CRY E, uh, is is a, a regulator of RAC uh, and controls protrusion formation during. Um, cell migration and, and other cell behaviors. Um, and, and then he went on to uh, do his postdoc uh, with Ian Makara at, at Vanderbilt in Nashville, um, where he's been working on pluripotent stem cells uh, and their, their epithelial identity and, and how, how mechanobiology in, in these cells regulates their, their fate. Uh, and so today he's going to tell us uh, a little bit about his his work as a postdoc. They had a really beautiful nature cell biology paper recently um, on conversion of stem cells to to cardiac lineage. Uh, and then he'll tell us a little, little bit about some of the ideas that he's thinking about as he as he uh, uh, establishes his own lab. So, uh, Loic, we're really excited to have you here uh, and look forward to hearing some great science. Thank you very much, Joel, um, and thank you to uh, the uh, CMB uh, community for having me today. And I also want to thank uh, Annie for organizing all of this and dealing with my hundreds of email I had to send her. Uh, so I really appreciate everybody uh, making this uh, talk very uh, smooth. So, um, so yes, today I'd like to share with you uh, two different stories. Uh, one. Um, I hope I'm not going to uh, lose a lot of you, but it's more like developmental uh, biology. Uh, but I think th this part will be required uh, to have the building blocks to understand my second part, which is more uh, mechanobiology uh, focused. So today I'd like to share with you uh, the, uh, the role of uh, apoptosis, nucleotide, and cell tension on what is the crosstalk between those three different elements that seems to be totally unrelated. So uh, let me start with uh, this uh, beautiful imaging of a developing uh, uh, mouse embryo imaged directly in the, the, the pregnant uh, mouse. And what we are focusing here, uh, it's the uh, very early stages of uh, cardiac formation and how the uh, heart tube is, is being formed. So what you will see is this uh, the apparition of those green cells, which are cardiac precursors, and they uh, start coming together and, and to migrate together and to form this uh, developing uh, cardiac loop that will start beating at the end of the movie. And a lot of things are going on here. You can see those green cells, some of them die, some of them are uh, protruding, some of them are uh, experiencing like repulsion. So like a lot of is going on. And, and this uh, stage of development is actually critical uh, uh, for uh, the uh, survival of the embryo because the heart is the first organ to develop. And the defect in specifying those cardiac precursors will lead to um, uh, different diseases, the main one being a congenital heart defect. And this is uh, not something that affects only a, a, a few percentage of the population. It, it's, 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 uh, it affects 1% of all US newborn. And that's actually the leading cause of uh, uh, death in, uh, in uh, the uh, infants. Uh, and the interesting part to me was that only 15% of all those cases have been linked to a, a genetic uh, defect, meaning that 85% uh, 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 is unknown. We don't know what's the etiology of this disease. And also uh, this leads us to us as uh, fundamental cell biologists to have 
uh, a, a lot of work to do to better understand uh, these uh, uh, defects in uh, heart development. And, and, and with that in mind, when I started joining, uh, when I joined Ian's lab, uh, I decided to uh, better understand the development of the cardiac lineage using, using induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs as a model to uh, drive the differentiation of the cells to the uh, cardiac mesoderm. So this uh, differentiation is not like a straight line, right? So it, it, the, this differentiation from iPSCs to uh, cardiomyocytes go through uh, successive stages of differentiation. And I've highlighted some of the uh, main steps that are important. And each of those steps are uh, marked by a specific marker that I'm, I'm going to use during this talk. But you don't have to remember any of those because I'm trying to every time bring back to uh, the uh, uh, cell lineage context. So what we use to differentiate those iPSCs is that we use this uh, small molecule uh, called CHIR, which is actually a wind activator. And this will lead the exit of the pluripotency of those uh, iPSCs and will drive them toward the primitive street. And um, if you manage to get those, this uh, differentiation protocol working, uh, you will end up with uh, beating cells in your dish. And, and this is actually beautiful to see. I remember the first time I got those cells, like everybody in the lab was under the uh, microscope looking at those cells beating because that's something that uh, we were not really used to in, in the lab. So, um, what, uh, so Jan's lab is really uh, focusing on epithelial biology. And what we quickly notice is that iPSCs are strongly epithelial. And actually their epithelial features is required to uh, become iPSCs. And um, we were wondering uh, when do those epithelial features get lost to become uh, cardiac uh, cells, which are highly mesenchymal, as you can see on those uh, immunofluorescent staining, uh, stain for uh, ZO1, which is an epithelial marker in green. ZO1 is at the tight junction in the iPSCs and is uh, absent from those junction in the uh, uh, cardio cardiac cells. However, you get the expression of this uh, mesenchymal marker called slug. So we were wondering what's happening and how this epithelial to mesenchymal transition is regulated. So I'm going to uh, quickly summarize uh, the boring part of uh, our paper, which uh, we found that this um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition is actually pretty synchronous. So this happened uh, within 50 to 52 hours post differentiation. So um, and this epithelial to mesenchymal transition, not surprisingly, is regulated by uh, the two main uh, EMT uh, regulator called Snell and Slug. What we found is that also those two EMT markers is actually, are actually regulated by this upstream regulator called, called MESP1. And if you now cut MESP1, you won't get uh, Snell and Slug expression, and this will block uh, this epithelial to mesenchymal transition from occurring. So with this data in, in, in mind, we were really wondering uh, what cellular events uh, are actually driving this uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition? And to, to try to address this question, we obtain a, a ZO1 a knocking cell line uh, that we started imaging. So you can see ZO1 uh, is that the um, uh, tight junction. And I'm going to play this movie when I treat those cells with CHIR. And what you will see at the beginning, not so much happening. However, at some point, you will see the formation of uh, those cellular rings, which seems to be pretty synchronous. And then you have this uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition that happened and the cells start to uh, break apart. So we started wondering um, what were those cellular rings that we uh, could see. And um, one hypothesis that maybe uh, they were either uh, cell being extruded by the monolayer, or they were 
uh, dying cells that were pushed out from the monolayer. And we started with the uh, cell death hypothesis, and we started addressing are those uh, extrusion events related to cell death. And to do this, we uh, decided to stain for a cell death marker. Here I'm showing you a cliff cast phase three. And you can see on this uh, IF, but also the quantification, which might be easier to see, there is this uh, transient increase of cell death during the first 24 hours of differentiation. And this slightly goes back down to the basal level by three days of differentiation. And we uh, started asking, OK, is this uh, cell death that we see actually just a, a off target effect of our differentiation protocol, or, or, or does it have a function? And to do this, we decided to uh, perturb the apoptotic pathways in uh, different ways. Uh, first, uh, we uh, created uh, backs and back double knockout, which uh, are part of the apoptotic pathway. And when you knock out those two proteins, you totally block the apoptotic pathway. We also uh, created some cast space three and cast space nine knockout, and we confirm all our data with this uh, small molecule inhibitor of cast spaces called a QBD. But for this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on our data on the backs and back double knockouts. So our first experiment was to take control cells and to let them differentiate. And what we saw is that uh, those EMT markers, nail and slug, that you can see on this Western blot, are being turned on in a temporal way that I've previously described. Um, and he, by three days of treatment, those cells have, hand, have undergone EMT seen by the absence of ZO1 at the cell-to-cell -cell junction. However, very surprisingly, when we use the same protocol on our uh, backs and back double knockout, which are deficient uh, of uh, uh, the apoptotic pathway, we noticed that the uh, snail and slug were not expressed anymore, and those cells maintained their epithelial features. As you can see, you can see this beautiful epithelial uh, um, uh, staining of ZO1 at the cell to cell junction. Uh, and not only this, but if you uh, where to screen a, a, a bunch of different uh, markers during differentiation, for example, markers for the primitive streak or markers for the cardiac mesoderm. In our uh, cell deficient in apoptosis, there is this very strong uh, reduction of those markers. Uh, and, and fair enough, if you decide to complete the entire differentiation protocol to create uh, uh, cardiac cells, uh, those uh, the control cells with express all the cardiac markers and are beating uh, by 10 to 12 days of uh, differentiation. However, the double knockout cells totally lack uh, all of these markers and of course do not beat. So um, the first part of uh, my talk is really that there is this transient wave of apopt apoptosis that uh, happens during differentiation. And if you were to uh, block apoptosis in the pharmaceutical or genetic ways, uh, you uh, totally abrogate the differentiation of those cells. So this part was uh, already quite interesting for us, but the, the key question is what's so uh, special about those dying cells? So we starting hypothesizing that uh, they might be releasing some kind of signal that would trigger this epithelial to mesenchymal transition. To address this, we took advantage of our uh, backs and back double knockout, which, like I showed you in the previous slide, do not undergo apoptosis. And uh, we decided to do a conditioned media experiment where we treated at the same time uh, control cells and backs and back double knockout cells with the CHIR to drive their differentiation. During the first 24 hours, the control, the control cells will uh, undergo cell death. And what we did, we took the supernatant of those control cells and pour it over the backs and back double knockout. And we start addressing, does, hap does apoptosis happen in this uh, condition media experiment? What we uh, saw was that um, on the top row, you can see the backs and back double knockout that were not in contact with condition media, and they maintain their uh, ZO1 at the cell-to-cell -cell junction. However, the exact same cells that have been 
in contact with the conditioned media from the controlled dying cells have totally lost their uh, epithelial features. And, and if you were to uh, do qPCR on uh, a lot of different uh, conditions, on a lot of different genes, uh, looking at uh, what's the difference in gene expression plus or minus condition media, you can see that we're able to rescue the expression of those uh, key EMT genes or cardiac mesoderm genes just by adding condition media on the top of those double knockout cells. This led us to conclude that the supernatant from apoptotic cells contains a, a soluble factor that uh, rescue EMT and also gene expression in apoptotic deficient uh, cells. And, and, and then the, the, the key question was really to understand what this signal could be. And uh, to, to uh, start addressing this question, we uh, went back to the literature and uh, we got really interested in uh, Cody Ravishandran uh, lab uh, research uh, that uh, really study uh, cell death uh, in uh, several contexts, uh, such as uh, uh, cancer progression or, or uh, immune infiltration. And uh, what, it, what his lab described was that uh, apoptosis is actually not a silent cell death like we all read in our uh, textbook. Uh, there is a, a regulated release of metabolites when cells are dying. And um, in the follow-up paper, he described uh, some of those metabolites and, and, and uh, some of them were nucleotides. And we decided to look in our system whether um, metabolites, specifically nucleotides, uh, were released. And to do this, um, I did a luciferase assay where I treated the cell with CHIR plus or minus QVD to block apoptosis. And I collected the supernatant and did my luciferase assay to quantify uh, whether uh, ATP were, uh, was being released. And what you can see is that um, the pink curve show a very sharp increase of ATP release uh, during differentiation, whereas the cells that are um, deficient in apoptosis, where apoptosis has been blocked, you have a very strong decrease in the ATP release, meaning that those dying cells at least release ATP, meaning that we confirm uh, some of the data from the Ravi Chandran lab. So um, our hypothesis then became um, uh, that nucleotide triphosphate uh, released by dying cells actually can be this messenger that we were looking for and can uh, regulate EMT and cardiac uh, identity. <clears throat> so to test this hypothesis, uh, I designed several uh, experiments that uh, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to walk you through. So the first experiment was really to deplete those nucleotide triphosphate. And to do this, we went back to our um, condition media experiment. And uh, at the time where we added the condition media, we also uh, treated this condition media with a pyrase, which is an enzyme that will dephosphorylate a nucleotide triphosphate to nucleotide monophosphate. And we uh, stain for the um, epithelial markers of one. And what we saw is that if we take uh, the double knockout cells uh, treated with the conditioned media, they undergo EMT, seen by the loss of the one. However, the same cells treated with both the conditioned media and with the apirase have a partial defect in this uh, EMT phenotype. And this was confirmed also at the Western blot level, if you were to treat cells with or without apirase, you will see that uh, the cells treated uh, without a pyrase has a much higher uh, expression of uh, brachyury, uh, which is a mesoderm marker, and EMOS, which is a, a, a primitive streak marker. Meaning that the dephosphorylation of ITP actually uh, affe uh, can affect uh, cell identity. Then uh, we decided to uh, go down this pathway and we started asking um, how are those nucleotide release? And um, uh, the Ravi Chandran lab uh, identified panexin 
uh, as um, channels that allow the release of intracellular nucleotide to the uh, extracellular uh, domain, uh, specifically uh, during uh, cell death. So uh, what we did, we created some uh, panexin-1 knockouts uh, confirmed by this Western blot, and we started treating those cells with our differentiation protocol and stained them for this mesoderm marker brachyury. What you can see is that the control cell seems to uh, express uh, brachyury um, at a very decent level. However, the, the uh, cells deficient in uh, panexin channel have a very strong reduction in uh, mesoderm identity. And this was also confirmed at the EMT level. If you were to probe for uh, EMT markers such as SNEL and SLUG in those, in those uh, panexin uh, knockout cells, you will see that SNEL and SLUG are totally suppressed. Then we uh, decided to ask uh, what's the, the function of those nucleotides uh, on the surviving population. So to do this, um, we decided to use this uh, suramine inhibitor, which is known to uh, block the binding of nucleotides to their receptor called uh, P2 pyrigenic receptor. When we did this, uh, you can see that when we treat those cells with suramine to block the binding of those nucleotide triphosphates, you can see that this, uh, the, the cells, even though uh, they seem to die at a similar uh, level than the control cells, they totally maintain their epithelial features. And also, if you were to look at EMT, they totally uh, uh, are defective in turning on Snell and Slug meaning that the inhibition of pyrogenic receptor seems to block EMT and cardiac uh, uh, differentiation. And, and the last part for, uh, uh, to test our hy hypothesis was really to test whether uh, those nucleotide triphosphate were sufficient to drive this epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And to do this, we again took advantage of our backs and back double knockout, which do not uh, die and do not undergo, undergo EMT. But instead of treating them only with THIR, we decided to sprinkle some of the uh, uh, nucleotide triphosphate that uh, uh, the Ravi Chandran uh, lab uh, identified. When we did this, uh, you can see that the double knockout cells treated with vehicle uh, seems to maintain their epithelial features. However, when you treat those cells with UTP or ATP, there is a, a very a partial uh, defect in this, uh, there is a, a partial rescue of this EMT uh, phenotype, meaning that those cells start undergoing uh, EMT. And very strikingly, if you were to add ADP as a, as a control, um, those, uh, those cells would not respond. And this experiment was actually crucial in our uh, system because I, I mentioned this uh, pyrogenic uh, receptor family, which is a, a huge uh, uh, family, which has a lot of uh, members, but the only receptor that is able to bind both ATP and UTP is actually this P2Y2 receptor. So um, the last experiment for uh, this part of my postdoctoral project was really to ask whether P2Y2 could be uh, mediating this uh, EMT phenotype and, and, mesoderm, and cardiac mesoderm commitment. So we designed a CRISPR knockout of this P2Y2 and did our, uh, uh, apply our differentiation protocol. And here I'm showing you uh, immunofluorescence of those uh, control cells or knockout cells stand for uh, ZO1 as an epithelial marker and slug as a mesenchymal marker. And you can see very strikingly that the uh, knockout, P2Y2 knockout cells maintain their ZO1 staining at the junction and also uh, more strikingly do not uh, turn on a slug. And, and fair enough, if you were to do QPCR on those cells as well, they have a very strong uh, reduction uh, in the expression of key um, mesoderm or EMT genes that are important for uh, those cells to become uh, cardiac cells. And once again, if you were to push the differentiation to uh, obtain beating cells in the control condition, uh, the P2Y2 knockout cells have a, a very strong defect in the expression of those uh, 
cardiac uh, protein that are required for their uh, function. Meaning that uh, P2Y2 signaling seems to drive this epithelial to mesenchymal transition and seems to also be required for this uh, mesodermal identity. This led us to uh, our uh, model uh, where um, the differentiation of stem cells to the cardiac uh, lineage uh, relies on this uh, gene network highlighted here, which is driven by CHIR. And those cells undergo this epithelial to mesenchymal transition that is crucial for their differentiation. However, in parallel, you have a subpopulation of cells that seems to undergo cell death. And those dying cells release uh, ATP and UTP through those uh, panixin one channel. And those two nucleotides can bind at the surface of the surviving population to their receptor P2Y2. And the conjunction of P2Y2 and CHIR act as a logical end gate, end gate to uh, promote the differentiation of those cells. Meaning that if you were to only have CHIR, um, in your differentiation protocol, you will not get a differentiation. If you were to only stimulate P2Y2, you will not get differentiation. You need both to drive this differentiation. But this model led us with a lot of uh, new questions to us. For example, uh, what's the signaling pathway downstream of P2Y2? And, and my undergraduate student is actually uh, making good progress on, on this part, looking at uh, the downstream uh, protein, or downstream of P2Y2, specifically GAlpha 12 and GAlpha Q, uh, which I'm not going to talk uh, for this talk. Um, and, and I'm just going to share a couple of slides on the um, 3D gastroly that we are trying to design, uh, and then we can move on to uh, the, the last part of the talk, which is more uh, mechanobiology focused. So um, we uh, decided to ask the question whether this apoptotic apoptotic signaling that we described was also happening in, in more physiological relevant model instead of cell splitting on the, on the 2D uh, surface. And um, we uh, decided to use this uh, newly published uh, gastriloid model, which are embryonic stem cell based uh, model. And uh, basically the, the, the protocol to obtain those gastriloid is that you uh, aggregate embryonic stem cell together and then stimulate them with CHIR. And follow this, you will have uh, uh, the this, uh, ball of cells will break symmetry and we start to define an anterior posterior axis and the posterior end will start growing. And very strikingly, if you were to probe for the three main lineages, uh, happening during gastrulation in the, in the uh, live embryo, you will be able in this gastrulic system to see the three main lineages, meaning the ectoderm, the endoderm, and, and uh, the uh, mesoderm. So we decided to use this technique uh, in our system. And we asked the question, does hypoptosis also happen in 3D gastroid? And also is it required for the gastroid formation and, and the lineage specification? So first we uh, ask, does hypoptosis happen at all in, those, in this uh, gastroid? And in, indeed it does. If you were to look at a uh, PARP cleavage on the Western blot, the top band of PARP is the uncleavation. And when it gets cleave upon uh, apoptosis induction, you will get this lower band that uh, appears. And you can see in our gastroid, the lower band is actually the predominant band. And we started then uh, affecting the, apoptotic, the apoptosis pathway in this system by treating uh, during the aggregation uh, step those cells, those uh, gastroloids with uh, QVD, which is the caspase inhibitor. And what you can see is that um, th we have uh, some heterogeneity in, in our hand in this system, but we always obtain those beautiful uh, elongated gastroid that are very similar to what is what was published by uh, in this nature paper describing this technique. However, very strikingly, when you block apoptosis in this system, you will never get those um, this elongation from 
we, you will never get elongation of those gas fluid. And this was quantified uh, by looking at the uh, aspect ratio or just by classifying the uh, gas fluid based on their shape, meaning that the wrong gas fluid or just a gas fluid that start budding uh, or the gas fluid that is fully elongated. So then we look at uh, the uh, lineage specification in this gas fluid. And very, uh, uh, very similarly to what was described in the nature paper, we uh, saw that uh, the uh, mesoderm identity uh, highlighted by this brachyury staining of T um, is actually uh, at the posterior end and seems to be at the tip of this gas fluid. However, when you block cell death, you will never get induction of this uh, brachyury staining. And this was also true here. I'm showing you like a, a, a spherical uh, uh, gas fluid after QVD treatment. But even if you were to have a tiny little bud uh, in this uh, in this gas fluid, brachyury will never show up in, in those pictures. Meaning that apoptosis seems to be important for the gas fluid organization and also the mesoderm identity in 3D. And this led us with the last part, uh, which I think uh, you're all waiting for, which is the more mechanobiology focused part. And um, this idea came with uh, actually one of the reviewer comment during our paper, because um, this reviewer highlighted this uh, cell paper from the stressor lab in Australia, uh, showing that uh, developmental apoptosis is actually not a require for development. So the the if you were to remove all most of the apoptotic pathways in a very uh, early stage of development, those uh, embryo will develop and and uh, create the uh, uh, very uh, an embryo that looks like a wild type embryo. And you can see on those um, IHC, you can see that um, this uh, back, back and buck uh, triple knockout uh, mouse strain uh, seems to develop fine, has somite, has like a midbrain, a forebrain, um, the, the main structure are there. Oh, however, they uh, die very quickly after birth, but seems that apoptosis is not required for a development. So the reviewer pointed this paper and um, what we uh, discussed uh, uh, as, a, as a review tool was that, yes, apoptosis, apoptosis might not be important in, in uh, development. However, the key uh, proteins in our system are actually mechanosensitive. For example, um, the panexin channel that I introduced you as being the channel allowing the release of those nucleotides from the dying cells have been very well described as being uh, mechanosensitive. And in parallel, a lot of papers now show the relation between um, apoptosis and forces, meaning that uh, uh, in this uh, paper from uh, the Ladu and the Toyama lab, uh, apoptosis was linked to uh, force induction uh, by uh, and related to also gene expression looking at uh, YAP, which is a main uh, mechanosensitive transcription factor. And, and uh, also around the same time, uh, this uh, uh, group in Japan, uh, actually, sorry, in, in France, um, published this uh, science paper linking the uh, development of the cardiac valve with mechanical forces which trigger the release of nucleotides and which affect gene expression. So as I was uh, thinking to move on to the next stage of my career, I decided to uh, um, dig into this uh, question about mechanotransduction and whether mechanotransduction can affect mesoderm differentiation. And so I think I don't have to introduce to this uh, audience that uh, forces are crucial during development. Uh, they are important for uh, the folding of the embryo or the closure of the uh, neural tube. They are even important at the earliest stage of development, which is the compaction of the four cell stages. And if you uh, were to look at those uh, vectorial uh, uh, arrows, uh, 
probing the forces experienced by the cells, you can see that there is a, a very a cyclic uh, uh, phenotype of these forces. And if you were to abrogate those forces at this stage, the, the embryo will uh, not develop. And also in our system, in IPSCs, I show that uh, there is, uh, the cell seems to experience differential forces during differentiation. So um, in collaboration with uh, the Rina King lab here at Vanderbilt in the uh, uh, bioengineering department, we decided to uh, look at uh, whether those cells uh, experience differential forces as they differentiate. And to do this, we use one of the techniques, uh, the Renard King lab design, uh, which is this uh, quantitative polarization microscopy, which is basically a way to probe um, the cell tension uh, just by looking at the polarization of uh, the light. And what we did is that uh, we fixed those cells at different time points and we uh, put them under the cupole uh, microscope and, and look at uh, cell contractility. And what we saw is that um, as the cell differentiate, they seems to uh, increase uh, their uh, uh, contractility uh, and we use the retardants as a redot for contractility. And this seems to be specific because if you were to uh, inhibit um, rock by using this uh, Y compound uh, to uh, stop the phosphorylation of uh, myosin light chain, this will lead to a very strong decrease in, in this retardants. So pretty uh, naively, I have to say, I thought, well, if I were to add rock inhibitor during differentiation, uh, I should block um, this differentiation from happening. So I did this. I treated the cell with CHIR in the presence of the absence of this uh, Y compound, which is this rock inhibitor. What I noticed is that uh, those cells treated with Y compound seems to undergo this epithelial to mesenchymal transition much, much earlier compared to the control cells. So I told you in my initial, uh, in my first part that this EMT that we see happen around um, 50 to 52 hours here. Um, you're looking at 48 hour time point. So the control cells are still uh, strongly epithelial. However, you can see that the uh, cells treated with the Y compound have totally lost their uh, ZO1 staining. And not only this, if you were to look by qPCR at uh, mesoderm or EMT markers, you would see in purple that the cells treated with the Y compound have a much higher expression of those markers uh, during differentiation. And not only this is true at the RNA level, but if you were to look at the protein level here, I'm bloating for Bracuri, which is this mesoderm marker, you can see that at 48 hours, the cells treated with this Y compound have a, a very strong increase in Bracuri expression. So um, this was a very counterintuitive uh, for us. And uh, we decided to use a, a different inhibitor to affect the contractility pathway. And we use this ML7, which is a very specific MLCK inhibitor, and which should mimic uh, what we see uh, when we use the Y compounds. When we did this, we actually totally confirm our data. You can see cells treated with ML7 or with the vehicle solution, and you still see this very strong induction of uh, Bracuri uh, after treatment with the ML7, meaning that inhibition of cell contractility seems to increase the specification uh, towards the mesoderm. But these data were very, um, I was very skeptical about this data, and we all know uh, all the uh, dumping of using um, uh, small molecule inhibitors. So I, I really wanted to confirm those data using a genetical way to modulate uh, cell contractility. And we started uh, doing this by uh, designing, by obtaining this uh, uh, constitutively active rock to construct that are uh, linked to uh, M Venus uh, 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 reporter. So we uh, use a lantiviral transfection to create a cell line that constitutively express a rock to. Uh, 
and, and sorry, express rock two, and this can be modulated with the addition of doxycycline. And what we did is that we did a co-culture where we mixed cell expressing rock two or control cells mixed together, induced uh, the construct with doxycycline, and then uh, trigger our differentiation protocol and, and, and look at uh, different uh, markers for mesoderm and EMT. Just to confirm that the system seems to work as it's supposed to, here you're looking at this co-culture experiment and you can see the um, M venous uh, positive cells. Uh, if you look at the actin, the actin is totally different from the cluster just below that is M venous negative. And you can see this actin have very uh, strong uh, um, uh, Cortical actin, which is a readout for cell contractility. And uh, in parallel, if you were to stand for a phosphomyosin-like chain as a marker for uh, cell contractility, you would see that the cluster of cells expressing M venous have very strong uh, phosphomyosin-like chain compared to the M venous negative uh, cluster. So this was just a way to confirm that this system was working. And when we look at mesoderm marker here, staying for Bracuri, we were actually uh, very happy to see that the cells expressing M venous are actually the cells that do not express uh, Bracuri and do not turn on the uh, mesoderm identity program. However, you have a, a, uh, this internal positive control of wild type cells mixed in this system, uh, which do not turn on M venous, which do not turn on uh, rock and have normal contractility. However, you see in this system that those cells uh, turn on Bracuri. And not only this, but if you were to look at uh, uh, EMT marker here, uh, sorry, I mislabeled my slide. It's not Bracuri, it's a uh, slug that we are looking at. Uh, you can see that the uh, M venous positive uh, cluster actually uh, does not have this EMT marker uh, slug. So uh, we quantify all of this uh, using also uh, another construct, the constitutive, constitutively active MLCK as a way to uh, confirm our data. And you can see that before addition of doxycycline, uh, there is no uh, difference in uh, expression of Bracuri marker. However, when you add doxycycline to turn on this uh, constitutively active construct, you see that the uh, cells that express M venous have a strong reduction in Bracuri marker compared to their M venous negative counterparts. Meaning that this uh, increased contractility seems to inhibit mesoderm uh, expression. And then to, uh, to make a, a link and close the loop with my first part of um, my talk, I, I really wanted to see whether uh, apoptosis and cell contractility actually have uh, uh, this epistatic correlation that was described by the uh, Ladu and Toyoma lab. So I'm going to walk you through this uh, slide, which can be uh, a bit uh, confusing. But uh, what I decided to do is that um, I took uh, cells not induced with our differentiation protocol and prop for Bracuri. You can see on the left part of the Western blood, there is no Bracuri expression. If I were to uh, induce those cells and differentiate them to mesoderm, you see this Bracuri expression marker. And this was confirmed by qPCR and also looking at over EMT marker by qPCR. If I were to uh, block cell death in those cells by adding this QVD, like we reported in our uh, paper last year, uh, I'm blocking uh, the expression of Bracuri. However, when I decided to co-treat uh, those cells that were defective in uh, cell death with a rock inhibitor, I was able to partially rescue this phenotype in terms of Bracuri expression, but also primitive streak and over mesoderm marker expression, and also at the EMT level. So the, the conclusion of this slide, it seems that there is a very, uh, the, those uh, two process, apoptosis and cell contractility, seems to have this epistatic relationship and uh, promoting cell relaxation seems to re rescue the phenotype link by the blockage of uh, apoptosis. So with that, I will end with um, 
my working model, which uh, like I showed you in my uh, first part of the talk, where apoptosis seems to trigger the release of nucleotide and acting through this uh, pregenic signaling pathway driving mesoderm identity. Um, it seems that uh, cell contractility specifically driven by uh, rock seems to uh, be upstream of this pathway and seems to inhibit either uh, nucleotide or P2Y2 uh, signaling. So this uh, actually leaves me with uh, quite a few direction. Uh, so uh, right now we are um, uh, looking at uh, different uh, mechanosensitive pathways, such as the HIPO pathway, but also the um, SRF MRTF pathway. And um, one uh, project is really to look at whether um, this phenotype is dependent of this uh, link complex, which uh, span uh, the uh, nuclear membrane and make the link between the actomyosin uh, network and uh, the uh, chromatin uh, architecture. And, and also looking at uh, whether pregenic signaling is actually uh, affected by cell contractility. And our, very, our global hypothesis is really that cell tension may actually prime wind target gene uh, to respond to the differentiating cue that uh, we uh, add to our cells. And um, with that, uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, my lab, especially uh, Ian for giving me the uh, freedom to uh, drive this, uh, this, these projects uh, to their end and uh, also to uh, be a, a, an extremely supportive mentor and also all my uh, lab mates and uh, uh, highlight to my undergrads, Jeremy Clements, who has been uh, driving the uh, gastroloic uh, system and looking at also the uh, G-alpha uh, uh, signaling downstream of P2Y2. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, to, uh, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, the Gamma Lab who uh, helped me initially with my training for iPSCs because I did not know anything about uh, prepotent stem cell when I moved to uh, Vanderbilt. And also uh, the Cynthia Rena King and the Vanderbilt Center of Mechanobiology for their uh, active collaboration and support. And uh, my um, uh, funding sources and also all the CMB organizing committee for helping me setting up this this uh, talk. And thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, I don't hear you, Joel. Oh, nope, sorry, I was muted. Thanks so much for a great talk. Uh, let's open up for questions. I wanna encourage folks to just unmute yourselves and talk or you can type it in um, and into the chat and, and I can read it out. While folks are, are preparing their questions, I, I have a couple for you. Um, mm -hmm. So have you, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this idea that that cells that are entering apoptosis are releasing um, nucleotide triphosphates. If you accelerate apoptosis so that you, you kill the cells off before the panexin mediated release, do you get the opposite effect? Like, can you push apoptosis faster and essentially have the same phenotype as the non-apoptotic. So let me make sure I understand. You, you, um, you, you would like me to um, kill the cells that would undergo apoptosis prior to before the the, the panexins can release the triphosphate, the nucleotide triphosphates. That that's that's like what so if they just true. go kaboom if they go kaboom do they do you still get atp I release see. i guess i see um i've not i've not tested this and but that's that's actually a good point uh, I, I i do not know uh, if i would trigger this differentiation if i were to remove those cells what, what we know is that it, it's very hard to, to know which cells will, will die. So we, we, mm -hmm. we show in the paper that um, this is a random event. Um, uh, I mean, random to our knowledge. And there are probably some uh, aspect that does not make it so random, but at least if you were to quantify the cells dying, there's no um, correlation with 
uh, their localization in the um, uh, cluster that they are at, or is there more at the edge or more in the middle of the colony? So this is uh, one part. So it's very hard to uh, totally kill those cells specifically and not kill the cells that would differentiate. So I'm not sure if fully uh, answer your question, but yeah, that's all right. Uh, did you did you look at whether the cells that go into apoptosis do they have high ATP levels? What's their metabolism? Do, are they like does does their metabolism predict their fate? Yeah, uh, great question. We actually had at Vanderbilt yesterday a talk about uh, metabolism and cell fate uh, uh, specification, and and it raised me like a lot of question about maybe the cells that are dying actually cells that have a defective metabolism. So we haven't looked mm -hmm. at, into this. What we know is that um, the, the cells that are dying um, are not, um, it's not cell competition. So if we were to look at MIC expression, uh, this, uh, which is the main driver of cell competition in, in mammalian system and in uh, during development, uh, those cells do not have higher MIC expression. So the MIC level seems to be equal in, in uh, cells uh, across our uh, population. So, so yeah, we, we still don't know what's so special about those dying cells. Yeah. Okay, so we have a, a question in the chat. Um, so I'll just read it out. HTP degrades quickly and may not be sufficient alone to trigger full EMT. Is it possible that additional apoptotic signaling pathways involving, say, TGF beta, Wnt, or BMP uh, contribute to the differentiation of the entire cell population, which is essential for cardiac lineage commitment? Yes, and 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 I think that's uh, that's that's uh, very possible. Um, what we so maybe uh, this person noticed that when I were to treat with uh, ATP, like I, I only get a partial rescue all the time. So like most of my phenotype are not like full rescue. So one uh, way of interpreting those data is that um, uh, ATP degrades so quickly. So it, it, it's uh, that's the reason why the rescue is only partial, and or that there is a, an alternative pathway that is also complementing this uh, pregenic signaling. And to my knowledge, it seems that the the latter is most likely the case uh, because if I were to um, add um, ATP gamma S, for example, which is non hydrolyzable form of ATP, uh, I would I would still get this this partial rescue of uh, my phenotype, meaning that most likely an over pathway is important. Uh, which one uh, we still do not know, and and this might be the the um, the forces that are involved as well. So we're still investigating these parts. All right, I, I want to bring you back to the paradox. Um, yeah. These the backs back box triple knockouts mm -hmm. don't die, right? They 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 make embryos. Now that you've done this, the mechanobiology stuff, do you think you can explain why? So. Or... What, what uh, no, would happen, I, I, I guess, maybe if you perturb mechano sensing or cytoskeleton in those triple knockouts? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, that's that's really where we would love to go. Um, I think the mechanical forces might be a way to um, for the embryo to still develop because of what I uh, touch on about the way uh, panexin channel gets open and closed by uh, forces, which can allow the release of those nucleotides and can trigger this uh, mesoderm specification independently of those cells dying. And, and also uh, this uh, paper uh, did not look at very early uh, developmental apoptosis, like what's happening in, in the uh, epiblast, for example, they, they, they didn't look at whether their uh, system would also block apoptosis at the uh, epiblast stage. So this, mm -hmm. those are the two parts that I think will be interesting to uh, look. Yeah, interesting. 
it sounds like a cool question for follow up. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, like, thanks so much for a really cool Thank talk. You. I'm, I'm, I, I've been very stimulated by these ideas, um, and and it's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks everybody for too. coming. Thank you.